The good news on this Easter day comes to us from the Gospel of Luke. Let us hear this story of praise and celebration. While they were talking among themselves, the, whoops, beginning with verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing. Him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? I love that text. It's one of my favorites um, that tells that good news story of Easter morning. But I suppose on this particular Sunday, I probably should have selected the story that comes from the Gospel of John after Mary discovers the empty tomb and weeping, she stumbles upon the gardener and asks him if he knows where they've taken the body of Jesus. And he says to her, Mary, and then she recognizes him. And of course she wants to embrace him, but he says, do not hold on to me, stay back, right? Social distancing, I mean, who knew? It's right there in the gospel story of Easter. This particular Easter, of course, we are gathered here, just my wife and I in this beautiful sacred space, and you are in your homes, and rightly so. When we were discussing um, what to do on this Sunday back in January. I was uh, hoping that we could have a combined service, a single service on Easter. We'd never done that before, a time when the church would just be packed. You know the movie Fiddler on the Roof? Remember when Tevye shakes his fist at God? You know, he's so angry, right? I kind of feel like that, except I would never blame God for this pandemic. God does not cause that kind of suffering. That's just not the way that God works in the world. The message of Easter is about life that comes out of death, not the other way around, right? The cross is the world's no to Jesus. Um, it is the empire's rejection of the justice of God. Easter is God's yes to Jesus. God's rejection of the injustice of empire. In the, the first letter of John, which is really a love letter to God, we read that God is love, right? And if you believe God is love, how could you ever believe that God would cause something like this? I mean, do we think God is schizophrenic? 
there are those who have made that suggestion. Franklin Graham made the claim that this is God's punishment upon the world for the world's failure to listen to God, which prompted one commentator online, Jim Wright, I think it was, to say basically they're accusing God of being a bioterrorist. I do not believe that that is the way that God works in the world. God does not cause that kind of suffering. The only kind of suffering that God causes is because when we love someone, we suffer with them. That's what empathy is. When your children are out late at night or if they are sick or if they've lost their job because of this crisis, you worry about them. When a loved one dies, right, you grieve over them. You cry when you watch movies like It's a Wonderful Life or Sophie's Choice or me anytime I see Mr. Rogers, right? There was a, a great picture in the news this week um, talking about the nonpartisan effort to bring aid to Haiti. And uh, President Obama had invited Presidents Bill Clinton and George W. Bush to join him in this effort uh, to rebuild that nation after a hurricane. And, and so there was this picture of President Obama with his hand on the shoulder of each of his two predecessors. And it, and it brought a tear to my eye. I mean, what is that about, right? Except longing for a something different than what is. And that's the work of God. When we know that the world could be different, when we know that life is possible, when we know that there is another possibility for us, God works on us in, in that way to work to bring about change. So yes, this is a time of suffering for many of us. And especially now, I long so much to be with you, to hug you, to cry with you, to laugh with you, to be together precisely in this time. And yet it cannot be. Dan Buckwalder is the reporter who wrote the article that appeared in the Eugene Weekly. And I know there were some inaccuracies in that uh, story. No, we do not live in South Eugene. And yes, we are broadcasting from the church today, not from our home as we had the last couple of Sundays. Um, but in the course of uh, interviewing me, Dan told me this story. Dan's a, a Lutheran. And uh, he said there was a Lutheran pastor who had also resigned from his church and Easter was his last Sunday. And so he came out um, on that particular morning and he said, Christ is risen. And the church responded in appropriate liturgical fashion, he is risen indeed. And he said more emphatically, Christ is risen. And they responded in kind, he is risen indeed. And he shouted, Christ is risen. And they shouted it in response, he's risen indeed. And he shouted, hallelujah. And they replied, hallelujah. And then he walked off. And that was the end. I, I was so tempted. I was so tempted. But if this should be my last sermon, right, that I ever give. Of course, preachers never die. They just move pulpits, right, change pulpits, although that's not what I'm doing, but if this should be the last sermon I should ever give, I cannot think of a better text to describe the essence of Christian faith. As my good friend, biblical scholar John Dominic Crossan puts it, that Luke here describes on one parabolic afternoon, the experience the disciples had not just on that one day, but on the days and weeks, months, years, and decades that follow the experience that we all have. I mean, what I find so intriguing about this text is who the heck is Cleopas, right? We've never heard of Cleopas and his companion, presumably his wife, we're not told. We've never heard of them up to this point. We never hear from them again. They could be just anyone. They could be any of us. And you see, that is precisely the point. It could be us that this too is our experience. This is the way that we experience the risen Christ. When we have those unexpected encounters, when, when we find Christ walking alongside of us, 
when our eyes are open to the presence of Christ, even at that table and sharing bread in human community. You know, it had to have been a very scary time for those folk. Of course, it was not just Jesus who was crucified. We remember there were two others. Unfortunately, the English translations usually describe them as criminals or thieves. The, the Greek word actually means bandits, as someone engaged in guerrilla warfare uh, against uh, the ruling powers, right? So this is state-sponsored terrorism. Uh, crucifying three people, they all, they, a means that Rome only used um, in response to rebellion and, and uh, treason. So to install fear in the people. And then to have these reports that the tomb was empty, that he has returned, right? Can you imagine uh, the confusion and the doubt and what does this mean? And think, too, even about the time in which Luke is writing this gospel. Uh, by this time, uh, Paul also has been executed by the Roman government, perhaps other leaders as well. Nero has blamed the burning of Rome on Christians. Uh, Jerusalem itself has been completely destroyed by the Roman army after a rebellion. Right? So it was a very turbulent, fearful time. And Luke writes this story about how Christ comes alongside too on this road to Emmaus, how Christ comes alongside us. I mean, I, the message could not be clear. God does not abandon us in the midst of crisis and certainly not in the midst of this pandemic. This is the essence of Christian faith. Wednesday night was of course the first night of Passover. And in the Jewish tradition on Passover, families gather from all around uh, to celebrate the Seder meal together. And you have to wonder what that would have been like. And um, rabbis, of course, they can't do that now, right? Just as we cannot gather here. Um, so rabbis in, uh, across the United States and Israel as well um, have been instructing their members of their congregation how to do the Seder online, virtually. Fortunately, we have this example from Leonardo da Vinci, um, who illustrated for us what the Lord's Supper would have been like uh, were it done by Zoom, right? Those who've done Zoom uh, can get to appreciate the humor of that uh, painting. But in the Passover story, as I listen to my Jewish brothers and sisters describe it now as they celebrated on that night and asked that question, why is this night different from all the rest, right? And, and, and give it new meaning in light of this pandemic, speaking of it as the 11th plague. Of course, in the first Passover story, there are 10 plagues. Only this virus does not pass over anyone. Right? It doesn't care whether you're Jewish or Christian or Gentile or Hindu or Buddhist. It doesn't care if you're American or European or Mexican or Chinese. It doesn't care if you're rich or poor, black or white. Though we are now learning that people of color are being disproportionately affected uh, by this virus, which says a lot more about the inequalities in our social systems about the inequities in the public health system than it says about any characteristics of this virus. But the good news is that there are heroes emerging from all corners of the globe, from all walks of life. And I'd like to just use as an illustration two people on complete opposite extremes. On the one hand, we have the captain uh, of the aircraft carrier, a white male, right, at the peak of power. I mean, it doesn't get much more powerful than to be a captain of an aircraft carrier. And at the other end of the, of the scale, there is this young African-American woman who is a grocery clerk in Maryland. Now, many of you, I think, probably have heard the story of Captain Crozier, um, the captain of the USS S, um, Theodore Roosevelt, the aircraft carrier, um, and how he risked his career 
for the safe, uh, safety and health of his crew members. And to add insult to injury, after he was relieved from his command, um, we learned that he too has been diagnosed with the coronavirus. The part of the story I did not know until I began doing a little research for this uh, was revealed by the great-great-grandson of uh, Theodore Roosevelt for whom that ship was named. We all know, of course, that he was president of the United States. And I think many of you know that uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, gained his fame as the leader of the Rough Riders in the Spanish-American War, um, a war that probably never should have been fought. And yeah, there were probably war crimes committed, but that's a different story. Um, but at the end of that war, when it was essentially won, uh, Commander Roosevelt, Captain Roosevelt, wanted to bring his troops home because malaria and yellow fever was killing more people than bombs and bullets. And for the safety of his men that had risked so much, he felt they needed to come home. Only the Secretary of War at that time would not allow it. He wanted to maintain that American presence and power there in Cuba. So what did Roosevelt do? He wrote a letter that was published in newspapers all across the country that, of course, put pressure then on the Secretary of War, and he relented and allowed those troops to come home. Now, he got his revenge on Roosevelt uh, when Roosevelt was nominated for a medal, Congressional Medal of Honor. The Secretary of War um, prevented that from happening. Uh, now, who today remembers the name of that Secretary of War, right? But we all remember the name of Teddy Roosevelt. And so too with Captain Crozier. I mean, who will remember the name of the acting Navy Secretary that removed him from his post, but all of those men and women that served on that ship, and indeed so many more in uniform, uh, will remember him as a hero because of what he did for his crew. Now the story of Leilani Jordan is just as remarkable maybe even more so. Here was a young woman with cerebral palsy who worked as a grocery clerk, stocking shelves, carrying bags of groceries out to the car for the customers. When the pandemic, and, and likely paid minimum wage, right? When the pandemic began and some of her coworkers fell ill, others called in sick because they were afraid, Leilani told her mother, that even though they were not yet being provided with hand sanitizers and other protective equipment that's still in the early days of the virus, and she didn't feel entirely safe, but because of the elderly clients, the customers in that store who depended on her to carry their bags of groceries out to their car, she continued to go to work. She put her life at risk for those elderly people. They were her friends. And indeed, she contacted, contracted the virus and died in her mother's arms on April 1st. These are the heroes today, putting their lives at risk for us. Throughout the Lenten season, I have been using an image that comes to us from the Orthodox tradition of the resurrection. And I have used it precisely for this reason, that it illustrates so well that it's not just about Jesus. It's about all of humanity represented by Adam and Eve who are being raised with Christ by Christ. You see, this pandemic, shows to us that we are one world, one humanity. And the only way we are going to defeat this is if we work together. It's not about this country first or that country first. It's about humanity first. One people, united, working together. Neighbor helping neighbor. A grocery worker helping elderly customers. These are the heroes of today, right? And not only that, but the truck drivers bringing the groceries to those stores, the sanitation workers who are still taking our, our garbage every week, 
the, the farm workers and the growers providing that food on which we depend, the volunteers making face masks and, and those that are preparing food for the hungry and serving people in shelters. These are the heroes, the doctors, the nurses, the janitors providing care in our healthcare facilities. These are the heroes who make it possible for us to stay at home in our place of privilege, to be able to be safe. And so, yes, this is the good news of Easter, that the church is empty, as it should be, to protect the lives of so many others. And remember this too, just as the church is empty, so too the tomb of Jesus is empty, because we are raised with him. That's what those two on the road to Emmaus discovered, that they too were raised with Christ in that moment. That's what the women at the tomb discovered, that they too were being raised by Christ in that moment. That's what those disciples locked into that room discovered. In that moment, they too were being raised by Christ. And so too we will discover when we come together to break bread together as God's people, as the living body of Christ, that we too are raised with him. Christ is risen. Hallelujah.